Welcome to the eighth and final event of the Tezos Educate series. We're very really happy to have you here with us. And today we will be talking about building a DAP on Tezos. So this event is part of a broader series um, to give you all the tools needed to start building on Tezos. So we already have seven other events on our YouTube channel that you can check out and learn more how you can get involved in the Tezos ecosystem. So I would like also to say that your questions are very, very welcome. So if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat and the Tezos team will get back to them over the course of the talk. The presentation will be recorded and will be live tomorrow on our YouTube channel around lunchtime. So you will be able to look back and share it with your friends if you like. And over uh, this event, we'll also draw various links about the program. And obviously, we've now had these eight educate events but we will very, very soon start a hackathon. And actually for the Tezos hackathon, the applications will be opening up tomorrow. So check our channels, it will be shared in the chat to get more information on how you can register and get involved in the hackathon. And this event as well is a great opportunity uh, for you to prepare for the hackathon. Okay, guys, so I think it's time to kick this off. Don't forget to drop your questions in the chat. And Tessa's team, thank you very much. And the floor is over to you. Hey, hello, everyone. Thank you. So um, today's uh, presentation is entitled uh, Dev Development on Tezos, putting it all together, because ultimately our goal with this, uh, this session is to go through the key takeaways that we had in the previous uh, sessions and uh, give you maybe a new take on them and also also at, at the end we'll say a few words about the Anko Tezos hackathon um we'll be splitting the uh, the technical part of the uh, presentation to two, two uh, parts. First, uh, we'll talk about uh, the architecture of a distributed application or DAP, and then about uh, user experience design for distributed applications. So starting with DAP architecture. So first of all, what is a DAP? Uh, a distributed application, or as uh, they're fashionably called, DApps are applications, usually web applications that rely on decentralized databases, which usually means or includes blockchains uh, and usually public blockchains specifically. And we can classify distributed applications by the, the degree of decentralization that they offer. I would say that we, we have like a a type of DAP that is fully decentralized, which means that the only thing needed to run it and use it is a browser and the blockchain. So most, by, by the way, quite a few Ethereum DAPs are of this sort. Um, so people who come from the Ethereum ecosystem might be very familiar with this. Um, in Tezos, uh, for reasons that we have already mentioned in the previous uh, sessions and we will like uh, talk about today, are more of the fully decentralizable variety. So in this case, even though there are more components than just a uh, browser and the blockchain itself, so in a way servers are involved and there's like some, some components that are so-called centralized because they have an IP address and um, they are like uh, something that your browser talks to. Uh, these are like, since the data, the, the truth all comes from the blockchain, 
and all data needed to run the application is accessible to anyone. It's public, essentially. Anyone with uh, like the the wish to to break free of that like centralized component can redeploy it or deploy their own uh, instance of uh, of a fully decentralizable app, <clears throat> which essentially uh, makes it in this manner decentralized and independent. Then there are semi-centralized apps uh, where there is some component of the app, some data maybe, that is proprietary, that belongs to a legal entity that is not, not open, that's not, not decentralized. For example, I think a, a good example of this would be CryptoKitties on the Ethereum blockchain, because they're the, the art and the generative algorithm of how like the crypto cat kitty images are put together are uh, <coughs> actually centralized and proprietary so even though the nfts themselves are decentralized in order for them to have like utility and uh, and meaning the centralized components are needed finally we have a class of applications which are arguably not even really dApps. Uh, they are centralized applications which have certain decentralized components. So, for example, a, a proprietary video game, uh, like a multi multiplayer game where NFTs are used for certain things, there the game itself is a traditional centralized proprietary software. It only has like a small component that is blockchain based. So, um, if we look at the at, at what what a DAP looks like in terms of architecture. Like what everyone's familiar with, of course, is it has an application front end which runs in the browser. And in case of a pure, fully decentralized DAP, the only other component is a blockchain node and possibly the decentralized storage, the IPFS node that it's, it, it's using to access IPFS. <coughs> All this, these other boxes to the right are things that uh, we can add in order to make certain things easier or possible. So first off, if we want to, to build a DAP on Tezos that has any like level of complexity, we will need an indexer and a database that the indexer is maintaining. The reason for this is that Tezos uh, smart contracts are deliberately less capable than Ethereum smart contracts in terms of query capabilities. So with, with the design of Tezos, um, it was really a goal of the designers to make smart contracts as minimal as possible. And so functions that are that do not need to be in the smart contract are discouraged from being included there. So the way a Tezos application or DAP usually looks is that we have the direct like blockchain connection through the wallet uh, for write operations. And, uh, and then we have an indexer which, con which essentially constantly crawls or queries the blockchain and builds an index DB, which, which is like a a queryable or query optimized database <clears throat> and allows the application to run uh, advanced and, uh, and complex queries on the blockchain data. And then we might want to add an application backend, which is like a traditional web uh, application backend. Uh, there are various functionalities that one might want to put here. And this might be open source, in which case the application is still decentralizable. Or if we are building a app with like a, an important enterprise component or that's tied in some way to a, a legal entity with like some proprietary knowledge or information or algorithms, then of course we will have a centralized DB and the application backend will be also mostly centralized. Uh, Benjamin is asking, how do you solve out HN? Is that authentication with the backend? Can a, can a wallet be used and how? Uh, authentication, when, 
we're talking about dApps, usually happens uh, via the blockchain uh, wallet. So, so the blockchain address, because that's what pretty much everything is tied to on the blockchain. So if, for example, let's look at the situation where we might uh, connect certain services or, or access to, to ownership of an uh, NFT. In that case, <clears throat> the user needs to, to prove that they are the owner of the NFT to be authenticated. Now, the way we do this is that uh, we, of course, connect the wallet on the front end, and we can ask the wallet to sign a, a, a payload. So in this case, we would have the wallet sign a payload that, that says, like, I am like uh, actually at this time on this computer, like maybe using some kind of challenge response logic that would <clears throat> essentially allow the backend and the front end to reliably authenticate that, uh, that this, uh, this user is actually the owner of that address. Then we can look at the blockchain data and uh, and make sure that or check that they they have the nft and in that way the authentication can be run the blockchain uh, logic is uh, like uh, implemented via a smart contract layer so a smart contract in in the parlance of uh, of public blockchains is code that runs on the blockchain and implements business logic restrictions. And the word itself predates blockchain and uh, pretty much just means any software or technical measure that implements business logic restrictions. So one metaphor that Nick Sabo, with, who is uh, a, an important scholar in this field, used was a smart contract, uh, like, like a, a very good smart contract example is a soda vending machine. <clears throat> in that it implements the logic of buying soda. Um, there's soda in the machine and there's change in the machine. And if I pay for soda, then I can take the soda out and I can take the change out that's due. But I can't otherwise access the soda or the change in the machine. Um, it's very important when we're designing a app to to clearly outline what goes in the smart contract layer. Execution time and storage on the blockchain are very limited and very expensive. So only trust critical components go here. So that is things that we need to be decentralized, that we need to be independent. For example, payments, ownership, that sort of thing. And as I mentioned, in Tezos, the smart contract layer is intentionally constrained in its query capabilities. So most Tezos dApps use an indexer for, for displaying and querying data. Another important decentralized component is, is decentralized off-chain storage. Um, storing data on the blockchain is so expensive that it would be prohibitive to store, like, for example, the artwork for, for an NFT actually on the blockchain. It would cost like probably hundreds of thousands of dollars on Ethereum, maybe millions. Um, so the solution to that is using off-chain decentralized storage. Usually the protocol called IPFS, which stands for Interplanetary File System. It's a bit of like an in-joke. Uh, I think uh, its official page, page says that it's not really interplanetary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so IPFS and in general, these decentralized storage solutions <clears throat> are decentralized, which means they are high redundancy and censorship resistant they are free and can store a lot of data, much unlike the blockchain. They are demand-driven, as at, at least IPFS is, in that uh, nodes, IPFS nodes de determine what data to, to replicate or to store based on what data is requested from them. And it is also volatile, so that data that's not super popular may be completely ejected from the network and may be forgotten. Another important part of IPFS is that it is content addressable. So the content is accessible through the content's hash, that is digital fingerprint. So if I upload a certain file to IPFS and someone on the other 
side of the world uploads the same file to IPFS, they will have the same address and will be accessible from anywhere. Now, if the availability of certain data, like the artwork for an NFT, is important to you, and there is a way around the volatility of IPFS, and that's called pinning. So you can pin data on a, an IPFS node. You can instruct the node never to eject, eject that. And of course, this, this means that you need to run an IPFS node yourself on like a computer with enough storage. But pinning is also accessible as a paid service from software as a service providers. Like one of them is called Pinata that like, for example, we at Easy Connect usually use. Then, of course, there are the centralized components of a DAP. There are the de facto centralized components, such as an indexer, the IPFS node, or even a blockchain node. If we think about it, the blockchain node usually is a centralized component that we all use. So, for example, in Ethereum, most DAPs by default, and the MetaMask wallet use this, the uh, Infura node, which is a centralized service. Um, it could include an open source backend that users can, uh, can redeploy themselves. It would include the web server that has that, that actually serves the UI to users. And uh, what makes them just de facto centralized is these are open source. They do not contain proprietary or restricted data. So anyone can just uh, pull them and deploy them. And so in a way, these do not constrain the decentralization. But then again, in certain types of dApps or blockchain-based applications, which aren't really dApps, there are fully centralized systems that are fully proprietary that cannot be user deployed. So like this MMO game example that I used before, there the game itself is of course not open. There are cases well, so most dApps uh, are in a way impersonal. They are public goods to be used by anyone. The smart contract is just a publicly accessible service. And when a user uses the dApp, then they are using their own wallet, their own blockchain identity to initiate all the operations. They are paying for the, the blockchain transaction fees, etc. But sometimes uh, we need to design a blockchain-based system probably not really DAP at that point, that involves a legal entity, like someone who is an actual company or person or NGO, which has a blockchain identity that is a wallet. And the normal functioning of the system would uh, involve this entity doing things on the blockchain for the users. So for example, if someone wants to build an application uh, where they, like an, as an art project, they would like to mint NFTs for everyone who finds a certain geocache. Now, of course, then they, as the artist, uh, need to mint the NFTs and give them out to the users who found the geocache. And if we want it to be like automatic and transparent, then Essentially, what's needed here is a centralized automated system, which has a blockchain wallet, which does the minting operations. And there are like certain solutions to this that, uh, for example, this is like probably the one of the most uh, frequent things that we have done uh, on Tezos like so far as like uh, you cannot imagine all the people who want to mint and distribute NFTs. It's, uh, it seems like a really popular thing to do. And so we built a, a task engine that, that's essentially for this. It, it has a wallet and we can tell it what to do and, uh, and it can be instructed to do this thing. Uh, and here's a link to, to this application. It's called Peppermint. I think it, during the hackathon, it will be a really huge help for anyone who, who wants to do something like this. Then, of course, there is the front end. The roles of the front end are, of course, the regular front end roles. It's a present presentation layer. That's where we really optimize the user experience. Uh, 
but also it's where we connect the blockchain wallet. So that's where we manage our identity. And often we can put non-trust critical business logic in the front end. So as long as the as the smart contract protects from malicious operations, we can do everything else that's non-critical in the front end. Question. Okay. Is fully decentralized apps really the holy grail? Does it make sense for some parts to stay centralized? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it does because uh, fully decentralized involves trade-offs that you might not want to make. So, for example, on Tezos, if you want to display any kind of historical data, like, for example, you have a marketplace and you want to display price history, it is like literally impossible to query that directly from the blockchain. So that already means that you need an indexer. And then maybe, you know, you want to do uh, something that, that involves a little more calculation that would make sense to put in a traditional backend. Maybe you want to use uh, some kind of proprietary design and, and visual assets that you don't want to open source. So people can, of course, like redeploy the DAP, but you don't want to share your, uh, your front end design, and, which is like your IP, maybe your branding. So in that way, there will always be like components or, or there, there will probably be components that are some degree of centralized. And of course, if someone wants to go in a really purist route and just develop a, a fully decentralized app, that is and can be a, a very valid uh, goal in certain cases. It's just usually um, more inconvenient uh, than what is worth. We have one more. Would it be possible to temporarily rent one NFT to several users at the same time with a smart contract? Um, well, I mean, that is uh, a good question. It, it, that would be, involve like the question of, uh, of what renting means it, at this point, uh, of, uh, of what uh, actual behaviors we would expect out of that. So... For example, if we're talking about something like, like what, what are we using the NFT for? So is it for like some, for accessing some service? Then of course we can have like some kind of uh, smart contract where users can sign up to access the benefits of that NFT without actually owning it for a certain period of time. And then, then of course, it's it's only up to the, the design of the smart contract, how many people can do that. If we're actually talking about holding the NFT on the blockchain in one's wallet, then not so much. It, there are like, like, maybe we could just mint new NFTs which only represent the original NFT for like a certain period of time. I'm not sure how much sense that would make or, but like it, these, these sorts of questions are, are usually very application specific. And when, when you want to, to design something, you, you generally sit down and spend like maybe a day thinking about things like that, talking to your team, et cetera. So, two key technologies that I need to mention here about like front end is Beacon, uh, which is a wallet connectivity library, and Takito, which is uh, the Tezos JavaScript or TypeScript framework, which I'm pretty sure everyone is uh, going to be using for their front-end blockchain operations. It is, by the way, the most, um, most mature and most stable Tezos uh, framework or SDK. So even in backend, I, I hardly recommend doing it a Node.js backend and using Takita. When designing a DAP, I think the, the most important questions to ask are security questions. So ultimately we're, we're designing a lock, we're, we're designing a safe. Um, and so we need to think with the mind of, of someone who's designing a safe. Um, these are like questions that I think are very important. Like what operations need to be trusted? And that of course informs what goes into the smart contract. What data is trust critical? So like 
what data is, you know, could someone change in order to gain undue benefits? What components can be exploited in the DAP? For example, if, if you're building a decentralized game, how can one cheat in that game? Uh, how could one benefit from exploiting a certain component? Like, for example, IPFS, uh, how could one uh, benefit from faking an IPFS node and responses from there? Uh, who is in a position to exploit these components and how does their position set them up for this? Asking these questions and finding answers for them will help you find better solutions and inform your design process. And finally, and this is actually something that, uh, that connects back to the, the questions about centralization and decentralization. What are the components that a user implicitly has to trust when they are using the, the DAP? So what way could they be harmed if these components were malicious? Like if the blockchain node you are connecting to is giving you fake data or is censoring your requests, how can you be harmed by that? Or if the backend is malicious, that's centralized, or the indexer is giving you fake data, how can you be harmed by that? How could the users mitigate these risks? <clears throat> so for example, if there's a lot of money at stake, could they run their own indexer? And what can you as a designer do to mitigate these risks? These are pretty much the, the very, very core of designing a good DAP because Ultimately, ADAP is a security application. And now I'll give it over to Anita for design. Yes. Uh, before we start the design part, maybe if there are any questions about it. So one question was, did you succeed using Takito and Beacon with uh, the last Itaka network? <clears throat> Sorry? Uh, so yeah, Takito and Beacon and the last Takito, Takito has a new uh, version that came out recently that already supports Itaka. I'm not sure about the state of Beacon, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be, uh, if it doesn't support Itaka right now, then it will very soon. And another question is, what makes Tezos different from the Ethereum development stack? Um, well, a lot of things. Uh, Ethereum was developed with the goal to, to make everything easier. So like the, the protocol itself was, was developed in a way or designed in a way to make uh, developing Ethereum clients simpler. And the Ethereum languages and the, the Ethereum virtual machine were designed in a way to make developing for them easier. So like Solidity itself was pretty much designed to be accessible to literally anyone. Um, this also was developed from a perspective of, of making everything as secure as possible, which for example, like this, the Tezos Mikkelsen VM is uh, strongly typed as opposed to like the, uh, like the generic untyped uh, assembly-like behavior of, uh, of the EVM. Um, there are like uh, some design decisions in that a Solidity smart contract is, is usually designed to be like a, a queryable, like relatively self-contained system, while a Tezos smart contract usually has very limited query capabilities. Um, like in general uh, with Ethereum, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to write smart contracts and to have a lot of functionality in smart contracts. This is still uh, like Mikkelsen VM is still a Turing complete smart contract VM, but it's kind of like com comparing uh, maybe like C to or C++ to Rust. Like writing a Rust program is, is a bit harder but it's also harder to write a broken program in Rust than in C++. So it's the same with Tezos. It's, it's a bit more hassle to write a, a smart contract in Tezos or that, but uh, if it looks right, it, it's, it will usually be more auditable and, and that will probably translate in, in it being 
potentially more secure. Are there communities who can help with auditing uh, contract secure security? Um, auditing contract security is a big business. It costs usually a lot of money, and we're talking tens of thousands of euros. Um, there are like uh, various uh, offices and companies whose mainstream of revenue is this. Um, in like, of course, uh, the communities uh, will probably provide you like community uh, help. So you can post a smart contract and and people will review it and, and give you critique. But of course, it's like not the same level of uh, scrutiny as if, you know, you actually paid someone to do that. Okay, and another one, what to do for our DAP if a popular node is facing a DDoS attack? Well, um, generally, you will want, you want to make it so that the user can select uh, their own blockchain node. And also, when you're when you're developing a app, and, and usually we'll use one of the uh, like uh, community blockchain nodes. And uh, Tezos has like a number of community nodes that are maintained by and for the community. At the same time, as soon as your application becomes like something that earns money, that is like really popular, it just uh, doesn't doesn't make sense not to run your own node. And you know, of course, because that node will be uh, exclusively used for your DAP, and uh, that will limit fallout from like maybe an NFT drop happening at the same time and then all the, the public nodes going like uh, down from, from overuse or, or from DDoS attacks. So generally like try to, uh, to, to make it possible for users to select a, a node. And uh, also if you're like building a, a, a high throughput app then just run your own node. And then the last one for now is whether you are aware of any source for architecting, designing, engineering, and securing dApps, like any good resource for best practices? Uh, there are quite a few. Most of them are very Ethereum focused, but if, we're, if you're thinking about like security practices and, uh, and some such, then they, most of them are uh, portable to Tezos. Um, there are a few resources, blog posts on Tezos, uh, but they tend to be like more focused toward um, like more advanced uh, uh, people who are like familiar with with Tezos and at smart contracts already. Uh, I I think we can probably maybe share a a number of like links later in the coming days. Um. Okay, yeah, so shifting gears into more of the user side and the design process. Um, again, like similar to what Donnie just did, just wanted to recap things that have been covered in um, the previous presentations on UX and also front end, um, and also use an example of a previous project that we've worked on to kind of highlight what each of the stages um, in this design process look like. Um, to maybe hopefully get things a little more concrete as you guys go into the hackathon. Um, but yeah, to recap the summary of the process, um, like the different design stages, we have first you identify the problem to solve, then you think about your user types. Um, from there, you brainstorm features to support the user goals of those user types. Um, and then once you kind of have the features in mind, you start diagramming the user flows and detailing what exactly happens. Um, once you have that kind of master plan of what's going on, then you move to the uh, designing the actual UI. Um, while you're designing the UI, it's always important, especially in this um, environment like the blockchain ecosystem, to write good UX copy, so clear, concise, and useful, and validate your ideas with user testing um, as you go, just to make sure that you're on the right track. So I'm going to go into each of these and kind of give a bit of examples. Um, 
So for example, a project that we had um, was to design, was to use NFTs in a video game tournament. Um, and so we were, um, when we were identifying, okay, how do we do this? If you do it from a user-based perspective, um, the question is, okay, what is the problem to solve? Like, what is a meaningful use case for NFTs in a video game tournament? Um, so the, that's kind of like the first step of like, okay, what are we actually making here, right? Um, and then you develop a few questions. It doesn't have to be like major or complicated, but just to help guide you um, and get you on the right track of what might actually be a meaningful use case that would get people excited. Um, so here, like sample interview questions would just be, tell me about the last time you participated in a video game tournament and observed a video game tournament. So already, we know that there are plenty of people participating, but then there's a huge group of people who are observing as well. Um, and why the question is phrased this way is, and why we're not asking, so what do you think of meaningful use case for an NFT in this one is, is because people's behaviors and explaining their behaviors will give you a lot more insight than what they think their behaviors are even, or what they think is a good idea. So what you think is a good idea can be completely separate from you know, the reality of the situation or how you actually behave. Um, everyone has an opinion about stuff. What you're interested in at this stage is kind of excavating and kind of being like, you know, putting the pieces together and finding the trends um, in things like, for example, the sources of value in a tournament for participants and observers, and also potentially signs of accomplishment in a tournament um, and how NFTs might be integrated into those signs of accomplishment. Um, so yeah, framing questions open-ended, you don't need that many questions, but just something to um, start kind of connecting, you know, this idea, this idea in the sky with something on the ground and for all users. Um, then, of course, like as you're talking to users and just having conversations, it's important to think through um, the user types. And we've mentioned this before, but specifically, it's always important to keep in mind like what their experience and expectation is with blockchain and the specific area that you want to develop a dApp in. Um, so here it's completely fine to just say what's your experience with blockchain you don't have to <laughs> you know massage it and like expect like a story or something they can just this again is like a reporting question um but here the important questions were what's your experience with blockchain and nfts and what is your experience with this video game in this tournament and so that way we're looking for their knowledge behavior and patterns uh behavior patterns and also they their attitudes, like um, attitudes around NFTs, for example, can be very polarized. Um, so that's kind of like an interesting thing to ask about um, because you will kind of be managing that. Um, and also their values um, in general, like maybe they, well, I'll get to it on the next slide, but, um, but yeah, so basically, I mean, this is kind of relates these two slides relate to what we mentioned in the ux presentation about jobs to be done you're kind of thinking about the context that the users are in and what specifically how they're specifically positioned in it um, and trying to find okay what is the value proposition here um, you don't have to do anything like crazy in-depth like personas um, or asking like how many kids they have and where they live or any I don't know if you guys are familiar with these persona types that go like super deep like you just need a couple of questions to start thinking concretely about who you're building for. So in our case the user research results um, and in this case we also talked with the company who is very intimate with their users and know a lot about their interests um, but our I guess results of the user research were that um, we wanted to give an NFT player who dealt the final blow in the tournament um, to a victim, give them an NFT to kind of commemorate that final blow. <laughs> um, so um, that was kind of like what we decided to do with the DAP um, and the user type. So what we learned about the blockchain experience is that most of the people who played the video game didn't have much interaction. and even if there were a range, we definitely needed to accommodate for the most minimal knowledge. Um, and definitely there was kind of like attitudes wise, a lot of wariness about NFT hype, which was also good to just keep in mind as we went along. Um, and in terms of the video game experience, um, the specific game, the players are super invested 
in the game and the surrounding world. It's been around for years. There's a huge culture around it. Um, and also the tournament is a really fun thing that people get like super invested in as well. Um, also in terms of, you know, the softer side of the users, we learned that they in general were very interested in new technologies and that they would really love the under the hood details of what specifically was going on with the NFTs. So whereas maybe like an NFT might be hypey, like on one hand, on the other hand, if they if that was an opportunity for them to engage with things and really learn about the details of blockchain technology, that could be a really cool value add. So this is again, like there's kind of like the user as the game player and then the user as a person who has interest in technologies and learning details and having kind of that full picture helped us yeah, just conceptualize what might be an interesting thing for them. Um, okay, so once you kind of have that idea of what's the problem I'm trying to solve and who are the users that I'm trying to solve it for, then you brainstorm features to support the user goals. Um, so here we just have some features and flows that we know we're going to need. So of course, you're always going to have to connect a wallet. In this case, we did it via the gaming account. So that was an important thing um, that was connecting a wallet flow, always number one, most important baseline thing. Um, and then we have the receive NFT flow. Then once you've received one, you have a send NFT flow. Um, then they have an option to top up their test balance via a faucet so that they could transfer th um, their NFTs um, without holding TES already. So that was just kind of something that we were able to do. Um, yeah, to kind of yeah, get the wheels going. It was like, uh, so since this was in a way <clears throat> a promotional uh, project, of course we had funds uh, so we could offer these uh, tournament players TES to, to cover their transaction expenses. So if you are like building a app without like uh, these kinds of like marketing funds, then this might not be something you, you can offer. But in our case, we determined that since our goal was to, to make people excited about the technology, about Tezos itself, and to, to bring them in with the least fr friction possible, and we had a budget, uh, this was deemed to be a, an important uh, part of, of the project itself. Yep, um, which also brings up a good point of balancing like the user goals with your own business goals. Um, yeah, so figuring out what exactly you're doing obviously is a combination of all of those. Um, and then, so those four flows are essential for people who actually are going to be receiving an NFT. Um, of course, there are a lot of participants in the tournament who don't necessarily get an NFT because they didn't deal a final blow <laughs> and also many observers um, of the tournament who might just want to browse the NFT gallery and participate in terms of just checking it out, seeing how it works. So we have also a browse NFT gallery and learn how it works um, as flows as well. So then moving to diagramming user flows, um, I talked about this in um, the previous UX presentation and I won't go in like full detail. Um, on kind of like the things to consider here. But as we've discussed before, like you, based on your user type and kind of what you're designing, it's um, important to kind of make a decision on the level of handholding and guidance and also abstraction from technical details. Um, we've talked about how, you know, both sides of the spectrum on these points can be good or bad. It just depends on your context and it's the decision you have to make and ideally just validate and user test with people to get a sense of if you're on the right track. Um, also, of course, as we've mentioned before, there's going to be off app interactions, like anything to do with the wallet. Um, so just nesting those interactions in details um, so that people have the full context when they are about to do the action and come back. Yeah, also, like with NFTs, there's like the, uh, the whole like concept of, of using uh, other like uh, third party NFT marketplaces and galleries uh, such as on tezosobject.com to, to view and trade those NFTs. So of course uh, we had to think about this part as well. We had to make sure that the NFTs show up correctly in object.com, et cetera. And also that we explained object.com sufficiently on the application so that 
even if they've never used scissors before, that they understand that, okay, like it could be interesting to me to put this up on object.com and see what happens. Um, so yeah, the specific interactions in the flow and then also like the broader off app, interesting things about like the ecosystem they could do because obviously that's the benefit of dApps. Um, and finally, as we've discussed before, just always keeping that kind of like meta level education flow in mind and just making sure and not necessarily just education, it could also be for people who don't need any education about it, but just making sure there's always a trail of information so people can get the information they need to know in that moment, and then they can dive deeper into all the specifics easily if they want. So here I just wanted to put up a diagram of the user flow because we've discussed it before, but um, I'm not sure how many of you guys have seen them or worked on them before. Um, so here we, I just um, screenshotted what we did for the connect wallet flow. And this is as fast as it can be, but I just want to show like, okay, so here we start off on the homepage. I just, I think it's useful to give a little bullet about like what's going on in the default case or what happens after a specific action. Um, and then any specifics about um, copy or any context that's going to be important later in the flow. So for the first rectangle, we have the gallery of all the minted NFTs from the tournament. And then in the navigation, we have a button that says sign in to claim NFTs. So then if they click the sign in to claim NFTs, then we go, the dashed line just symbolizes that it's outside of the application itself. So we connect, they sign in with the game connection. And then once they kind of go through that flow that we weren't in control of the design of, um, then they come back to the home page and they have they they are connected. Um, and then they have a modal that says connect external to Tezos wallet. So basically what happened, and I don't actually remember like the specific detail. I know we made a wallet for them once they connected their yeah. game ID. Yeah, so it was we, custodial. Right? Yeah, we, no, it was uh, based on this technology that KUKA is based on. So it's like a non-custodial uh, deterministic wallet that can can be connected to, to all of the accounts. And so this way, uh, we had a, a blockchain wallet connected to, to every uh, every game account uh, for that logged on. And this essentially took out all the friction from, uh, from the idea of having a wallet, connecting a wallet, etc. So people just like had an address and they could receive NFTs just by virtue of, of taking part of the uh, of the in, in the tournament, and uh, but of course we are prepared for people who might, uh, as you know, they they dig into blockchain or they might already have a certain blockchain knowledge and may have a hardware wallet, and of course we wanted to give those people the power to to connect that and and receive their NFTs directly onto their their own uh, wallets and addresses. Right, which is why, you know, we make the signing in and connecting with their account super easy, but then we immediately follow it up with the option to connect an existing Tezos wallet. Um, so here we just gave an explanation of why you might want to do that um, and then gave three options, either connect external Tezos wallet as the primary one, maybe later, which just close the modal and learn more, which link to the FAQ page. So if you connect the external to Zos wallet, it then pulled up the beacon modal and then they could connect that. Um, and then for maybe later, it just closed it and they always had the option in the account fly out to connect external wallet again. Um, and then the learn more link to the FAQ page and an anchored, anchored to a section that explained kind of like in detail what an external wallet's all about, why you might want to do that. Um, and how you would do that um, in a place where there's kind of like enough space to go into more detail. Um, and similarly, the account flyout again, like had the connect external wallet button again. Um, so yeah, this just a user flow just to show like the basics of like, okay, as you're making this, you kind of consider the different cases, you jot down, what do I want to tell the user at this point? You make sure you're accommodating for when you're connecting to external applications um, and you have the different 
options. So yes, I want to connect a wallet, but also no, I don't. And also I want to learn more. Um, so that's kind of how you think through the user flows. Um, and then uh, you get to the UI. I mean, in practice, it's, I think it makes sense also to start with sketches like pretty quickly. I mean, it's a useful brainstorming tool. So, I mean, UI is pretty late in this stage, but I mean, in practice, I think it happens like also immediately because you almost, you start having ideas early, um, which is fine. But in terms of like when to make it higher fidelity, the um, it kind of comes later. So you move from sketches, which can be super quick and brainstormy to wireframes that are kind of moving more toward like, okay, this is what it might actually look like. And then full high fidelity where you have the branded layer, you have the different um, states for different components um, and the whole thing. Um, so again, like we mentioned in earlier presentations in more detail, um, it's just good to keep in mind using Gestalt principles for design just to help with clear information architecture and always use UI patterns um, and be consistent with that to minimize cognitive load. And of course, keeping accessibility in mind as you're designing and building um, the UI. So I just put this here to show <laughs> just how bad your first sketch can be. And it's completely fine because this is like, it's so fast, honestly, and like so helpful to just sketch things out super quickly and be like, okay, I know I want sign in button top right. I know I want a gallery. We're gonna have the name of the NFT, I have all the details. Oh, we want to search. Just it can be as sloppy as possible as you need, but you can already start building something from here. But I do think it's way nicer to at least do this before you start actually building something um, because you have that moment of thinking through. Um, so yeah, just to show like this is before and then we have like the full the fully designed like in line with the brand of the game um yeah ui um so you know like a lot of things were solved already here <laughs> and uh we didn't have to like figure out all the like colors and stuff before getting to like the basic like functions that we wanted and the basic layout um yeah and then just in terms of coffee again like uh this is like my mini passion i would say um but uh especially in this context clear concise and useful coffee is really important um so in flows definitely pare it down to the essentials like what the user needs to know at that moment minimize complex language um again this is a balance um it depends on your users and what feels appropriate and how much you want to extract abstract from the technical language. Um, but I will follow that up with the next bullet, which is just be consistent. Um, so if you choose to be as technical as you could be, then just do that always um, and make sure you're using consistent wording and um, consistent language patterns are just helpful in terms of people kind of subconsciously like decreasing cognitive load by using like similar sentence structures for, for example, like all success messages follow a similar language structure. Um, it's just easier to digest. Um, and we mentioned before, but using tone as a tool to signal weight of action. So, um, you know, if you're about to do something on the blockchain, then knowing that it's, you know, a higher stakes moment, um, not necessarily with exclamation points, <laughs> like my example last time, but, um, but instead just being kind of like firm and um, clear and not so flippant in that moment. Um, so here's an example of the Connect External Tezos Wallet modal that we did. So here um, you can see like the name, the title of the modal is the action. Um, so it's just, you know, when the user starts skimming, it's like, okay, Connect External Tezos Wallet. They kind of get what the modal is about already. And if they don't <laughs> understand what that's all about and why they would do that, then they have a couple of sentences. Um, so here we explain, um, connect an activated Tezos wallet and choose it as your mint destination to receive NFTs there. So why would I do that to receive NFTs there? Why would I wanna receive NFTs there? Answered in the next sentence, um, once the NFTs are in the external wallet, you would be able to trade them on other platforms. So it does kind of like it is a complicated situation for someone who's totally new but this is as simple as a sentence could be almost and with while 
maintaining like the specifics that are important to know. Um, and then we have the primary button that where they can connect and then the maybe later and learn more are styled not even as secondary buttons, but as links just to kind of keep the tone light and emphasize the primary action. Um, and yeah, the learn more is there for further information. Um, finally, validate ideas with user testing. So um, I just wrote some sample tasks here that would be useful um, in this specific um, application. So um, basically with the with user testing, it's best to just like um, make quick prototypes. Um, I use Figma, it's super easy to make the prototypes. Um, and then have this couple of questions in mind that you want to check, are the users actually going to understand this? Um, or if you're like, I don't know if I should go with this decision or that decision, um, testing one and seeing what the feedback is. Um, so first question, oh, and also a note on recruitment. So there's some questions that are kind of, that could be anyone can answer that more would have to do with um, kind of broader usability questions about the application. Um, but then for questions related to, um, there are certain questions that would be like only valid answers would come from people who are actually of the target audience. So just also have that in mind as like when you're trying to see like, does this solution work? Is it a solution that you're wondering if it works usability wise in general, or if it works for that specific audience? Um, but yeah, so it's always good actually to, especially with kind of like a new application where you're expecting people to not necessarily be familiar with, with what's going on, um, a first task to say, okay, here you are, here's your learning page, describe what you see and kind of say out loud what you're thinking, um, what you're observing, what you want to click on. And in this way, you can see what people are making sense of, what in the design kind of grabs their I at first, what they deem is gonna be most important, what looks like an interesting avenue to click. And you can kind of see, is my de design prioritizing the right things? Am I communicating the right things? Um, and it's also a good starting point just to warm people up and to kind of talking out loud about their experience with the application and um, yeah. So then here, um, Again, like just keeping questions. So tasks should be precise, but also open-ended um, and not directing the user too much. Um, so here, important tasks to test would be collect an NFT you earned from the tournament, sell an NFT you earned, and learn about the technical details on how this works. Um, and just seeing where the users go from there. So it's actually not like beyond these sentences, we're not guiding them at all. And they kind of have like free reign on, okay, go figure it out. But it's intentionally like that um, because that's actually the orientation that the users are going to have once they open your application, like in real life. Um, so here, um, just testing with a couple users, five is completely sufficient. Um, it captures most, um, you, you start seeing patterns already, even usually after like, two or three testers um, and it can be pretty fast. And yeah, after you kind of like keep the questions open-ended and you kind of collect kind of feedback themes, then you can iterate on your design. Uh, I guess then we it's time um, to go towards uh, the end of this presentation. Thank you very much, Anita and Danny for giving us so many insights on how we can build apps on Tezos. But I think we still have some information about the upcoming hackathon that he is going to share with us. So let's stay with that for a bit. Then. All right. So the, the upcoming hackathon's overarching topic will be make the world a better place. So think about ideas that can create positive impact via Web3. So imagine ways in which the Tezos tech can be used to help people around the world and I think you can really let your imagination go wide here. I think we need a lot of good things to happen in the world. So if you have any ideas that could make the world a better place, start working on them, please. And we're going to be here to support uh, important dates. So we start on the 13th of April and the application deadline will be the 20th. Uh, submission date is the 15th of May, so it's a little more than four weeks. 
uh, that you have to build. And we're gonna have three tracks. Thank you. Ah, yeah, let's watch this. It's just a minute. <laughs> Making the world a better place through Paxos algorithms for consensus protocols. And we're making the world a better place through software defined data centers for cloud A better place through canonical data models to communicate between entities. A better place through scalable, fault tolerant distributed databases with acid transactions. And we are truly local, mobile, social. And we're completely so mo low. And we're mo low, so. We're low, mo, so, bro. We were so low, mo. But now we're mo low so. No, mo so low. No. Next up, executive chairman and chief visionary Ehrlich Bachman presenting Pied Piper. Since the dawn of time, mankind has sought to make things smaller. But until now. <laughs> Okay, so I think you got the point. It's better if you make the world a better place for yourself than if someone else makes it better for you. Uh, so here is a lot of encouragement and empowerment to make the world a better place. So we're going to have a, a beginner track where you'll have tutorials and we're going to have a bunch of prizes. So the first 50 submissions in bo both of these tasks can get uh, $50 in tests. Um, and then we're gonna have a bigger challenge uh, where we, which we call small but great. So every, every count, every step counts. Uh, so this is for like individuals and teams with, uh, with smaller ideas, build a depth, uh, with, a, with a clear goal and a clear vision. And the total price in this category is $10,000 in TES. And here we're gonna honor ideas as well. So if you have just good ideas, you might get a price uh, even for that. And we have the disrupt all the things uh, challenge, which is the most advanced. And for here, we really would like to see what are you truly capable of. So this is for bigger teams, bigger visions, bigger ideas, and bigger prices as well. And the total in this category is actually $35,000 in TES. Uh, it was just my miscalculate, miscalculia. <laughs> Uh, but the total is total is 35 here. So we are looking forward to have you guys on the hackathon. And we're gonna do all the communications on Discord. We're gonna have two more workshops coming. Uh, and I'm really, really excited to see what are you coming up with. So the, the announcement is going up tomorrow. You so you'll be able to see more information there as well. And you will also be able to register. So check out our channels. We will uh, submit the information on, on our Twitter, uh, Discord, website. The information is going to be all around the place. So you will definitely be able to find it. Yeah, so very excited to see what you guys come up with. Really excited to see your registrations coming in. Um, so the, the first... Um, the first event of the hackathon is going to be held on the 31st of March. So it would be really great if you um, register by then uh, because the launch event and the workshops are going to be super, super useful for you guys to attend to really create amazing projects uh, on Tezos. Okay, then I think we can go towards the end of the event. Thank you very much everyone for attending. As mentioned earlier, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you want to revisit it, share with others, just check it out there. Okay, so thank you very much all for joining. And then I guess we'll see a lot of you in the hackathon and maybe potentially in the future in the accelerator program as well. Okay, then bye-bye everyone.